this is Natalie Marine Streep with the Stanford Historical Society Oral History Project. It's May of 2021, and I'm really happy to be here with the 2021 Schofield Oral History Award winner. That's Darshani Lakmali Jayasinghe. And thanks so much for being here with us today. Um, we just want to learn a little bit more about you uh, and about your fabulous oral history project in transit, an oral history project on crossing borders. So could you introduce yourself and um, tell us how you ended up at Stanford? Thank you, Natalie, uh, for the introduction and for uh, chatting with me today. Um, so I've been at Stanford now for a while working on my PhD. Um, before that, I was at UMass Amherst. Um, I first came to the United States um, on a J visa, which is for um, scholars on visiting scholars through the Fulbright program. So that's how I actually ended up in the US. And as I worked through my master's, I realized uh, I actually want to uh, pursue a PhD as well. Um, and that's how I eventually ended up at Stanford. And where is your home? Home is Sri Lanka, um, which is an island um, just south of India. Um, and that's where I'm currently located as well. Um, I was in the Bay Area briefly, but I've come back to Sri Lanka and I'll be returning closer to graduation. Great. And what uh, department are you studying in at Stanford? Um, I'm in the Department of Comparative Literature, which is one of the departments within the Division of Literatures, Cultures and Languages. Okay, so tell um, us a little bit about your research project, your dissertation project, which I believe the Oral History Project is a part of, and um, why you decided on that research. Um, so my dissertation research, uh, to put it in a nutshell, is um, an exploration of how visa laws and policies impinge on the rights and dignities of Africans, particularly Africans from the global south. Um, so that was what I was working on when the pandemic struck. Um, and as the pandemic uh, exploded in the United States, um, I noticed that there were a lot of new policies, a lot of new directives which were issued um, with regard to international students. So although my dissertation research is more general and it kind of studies different types of visas, there is no specific visa category that I'm studying. I'm looking at um, how these visa laws and policies have an impact on all visa categories. But as the pandemic kept um, creating all these new rules for international students, I became more and more interested in that particular group of um, visa holders. Um, and as a result, I ended up starting this project. Um, I noticed how there were directives which required international students to go home at one point. Then there were directives which required international students to be enrolled in person if they were going to continue to live in the US. Then there was also an ICE directive which required uh, perhaps even deportation if they continue to be in the United States without signing up for in-person courses, which were not actually available at any of the universities because all the universities had gone online. Um, so as to F1 uh, student visa holder, I realized that there were all these challenges that international students were experiencing uh, specifically during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so that's how I started uh, working on this project and, it, and I realized these narratives are really important. Um, and an archive of it would one day be really important, not just for my own research, but I realized it was a historical moment um, that we were experiencing due to the pandemic and because of other reasons related to the pandemic. And I was really keen uh, on collecting those narratives um, because I thought those experiences of international students who make up 25% of Stanford student population actually, um, and those histories are really important as we uh, move forward. Right. And how did you go about finding people to interview? Um, so that was um, an interesting process. There was no one single way um, that I went about doing it. Uh, one of the ways was to really um, send out a very broad call for interviewees. Um, surprisingly enough, although I contacted various um, organizations, student bodies, departments, divisions, it wasn't as successful. And what I realized very soon is that although people had all these stories, they were anxious about telling that to someone that they didn't know. Uh, and also because the word, the archive, the, the, the moment the word archive comes up, they, there is a sense of anxiety, fear, that their anonymity will be compromised, that um, their stories will be recorded in a way that other people who they necessarily don't want to access it might have access to it at some point. So 
uh, I think my problem was not necessarily finding people, but then finding people who are willing to be interviewed and who are willing to have those stories remain in an archive um, accessible uh, to others in the future. Um, so as a result, I realized that I have to contact people in a more personal way. Uh, and I started reaching out to friends. I started reaching out to other contacts that I already had in certain student organizations. And it was really a trust network in the end, which, um, which got me most of my interviews. Of course, there were some people who signed up um, and just said, hey, this is like a really interesting project. I want to be interviewed. So there were those people. But I would say the majority of interviewees ended up um, really through um, reaching out to me uh, through trusted networks or through connections, which I found was really interesting. So you, you attracted uh, participants from really all over the world. I think there is like 20, over 20 countries represented, if I'm uh, correct. Um, yeah. what, what kind of themes do you see um, emerging as the interviews have been completed and you're starting to analyze the transcripts? Yeah, that's uh, something which is uh, really interesting to me right now as I'm going through the transcripts myself. Um, so one of the things I was doing purposefully and which you already pointed out was to make sure that I'm not gay getting interviews from the same continent or from this or from a set of similar countries in a similar region in a set of similar regions. Um, and the reason why I started doing that was I was really lucky at the beginning where I was getting interviews from very different places. And I soon realized, uh, which I perhaps wasn't necessarily expecting when I started out on this uh, project was that a lot of these processes are so similar across the board. Um, and I think that's one of the most interesting things for me. Sure, the countries are different um, and, um, and the kind of socio-political contexts are different, but you realize specifically if you look at the United States visa and how the whole security um, uh, process functions, uh, even if you take something as simple as entering an embassy, uh, the fact that you cannot carry your phone inside the embassy, the fact that you cannot carry anything, not even a backpack, um, so there were little things which, by the end of the day, I realized were standard across almost all the continents. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm noticing, um, how these visa laws and policies are applied in these regions where visas are required uh, with such um, uh, sort of uh, similar uh, policies. Um, the, another interesting thing is how students began to reflect on um, the kind of underlying racist or uh, discriminatory policies, which they hadn't necessarily thought through too much because they just treated it as a process that they had to go through. So I think what happened was as we first um, discussed their personal narratives and then went on to talk about larger questions such as, um, what do you think about general visa laws and policies? And how do you feel about some citizens being able to cross borders freely, whereas some citizens couldn't. So when we were getting to those questions, you can see that people are engaging genuinely with these questions in a way that they perhaps were not reflecting on before. Um, so that's one of the major themes which came up. And the third theme is really about support systems. So there was a lot of talk about uh, and reflection on how they felt supported at Stanford as international students. And they talked about the Bechtel International Student Center different faculty, different student organizations, but at the same time, they highlighted how there is so much emotional tax and, and so much um, money or resources or, or uh, energy that they have to pour into this process, which simply isn't understood well enough by faculty, by administrative staff, uh, which makes it really difficult for them in a very challenging time uh, like the pandemic, where there were more restrictions and as a result, regularly difficult processes were exacerbated. Um, so those were some of the main sort of bigger themes, I think, which came up across all the interviews. Yes, that um, sort of unseen burden, right? Mm -hmm. An invisible burden. Do you have any sort of favorite interview moments that stick in your mind from this process? Absolutely. So one of the uh, interviewees um, is one of these people who kind of, you know, left their home country, then explored about four different countries before they figured out which country from which to apply for the United States visa. Um, so she, she's a freshman. Um, so she narrated her entire story with so much spunk, with so much 
sort of spark. And this is after being um, her phone was stolen in one of the countries. So she was pickpocketed. After going through all of these experiences, she's just so happy. And she feels this is like a personal achievement that after eight months being on this visa journey, she finally managed to uh, come to the Bay Area in January 2021. Um, so just listening to, to her, I think, uh, was also um, the point at which I realized the resilience, right? how resilient these students can be uh, and how determined they are. So I think her story stuck out to me as a wonderful example of how someone has gone through uh, quite a few hardships. And she's very young. She's a freshman. And she's traveled alone. She didn't have anybody with her. And how she finally managed to achieve her goal of obtaining the visa to come to Stanford. And she was just absolutely happy that she made it to Stanford in January. And I interviewed her only about three weeks after her arrival at Stanford. So that story really, I think, is exemplary of the kind of resilience, the kind of determination um, that can um, spark a person's motivation, even in the middle of the pandemic. And that was one of the interviews that really stuck with me. And I sort of remind myself when I have to deal with some small challenge and I'm, you know, really exhausted, I remind myself, look, you've just talked to these people who've done so much to just to arrive in the Bay Area. Tell me just a little bit about how these interviews sort of fit into um, your larger research work. Uh, the oral history project is really an attempt to bring the contemporary narratives um, in conversation with the narratives that I've already been studying uh, and to really continue that conversation uh, and to understand how um, people's lived realities can be captured uh, and how it can be used for a better or a deeper understanding and also uh, to perhaps try at some point to humanize the process, um, given how uh, difficult certain individuals find the process, um, even in contemporary times. Well, it sounds like wonderful and very important work, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the final product and your analysis of the oral histories. So congratulations again on winning the Schofield Award, and best of luck to you, Lakmali. Thank you so much, Natalie.